And to me, if it's all about freedom, and I was totally bought into that idea about being about freedom, well then, you know, you, you gotta be about freedom across the board. Welcome to the Lions of Liberty podcast. It was your host, your guide, your shining beacon of liberty. Hello, hello, Liberty lovers, Liberty curious, Liberty haters even. Whatever direction you're coming at me from, I'm happy to have you here for another edition of the Lions of Liberty podcast, where I strive to advance the ideas of liberty and help you guys sort all this stuff out. This is the 170th episode of this program, and you can find the show notes for today's show over at lionsofliberty.com slash 170, where we link to everything we discuss in the show. Today's show is sponsored by Health Excellence Select. This is an incredibly exciting alternative to the standard corporatist Obamacare insurance that so many of us have become saddled with. Start the new year right by getting a fresh start with your health care. To learn more, head over to lionsofliberty.com slash health. My guest today is a private practicing general surgeon based out of Phoenix, Arizona. He is principal and founder of Valley Surgical Clinics, the largest and oldest group private surgical practice in Arizona. He was integrally involved in the creation and passage of the Arizona Healthcare Freedom Act. He also serves as treasurer of the U.S. Health Freedom Coalition, which promotes state constitutional protections of freedom of choice in healthcare decisions. If all that wasn't enough, he is also an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. Dr. Jeffrey A. Singer, are you ready to roar? You betcha. All right. That's what we like to hear. So, Dr. Singer, what first inspired you to get into the medical profession? Why did you become a doctor? wasn't anybody in my family. My, my dad was a taxi driver in New York City. My mom uh, was a secretary. I grew up in a, a blue-collar, low-middle-income neighborhood in Brooklyn. But I was always a, a reader, and I read a lot of – I really was drawn to reading books about biology and then human anatomy and – I, I remember reading the, the novel Arrowsmith by Sinclair Lewis when I was probably about 12 or 13. Uh, I just got, I, I decided by the time I was a junior high school that I think I wanted to be a doctor. And I've kind of felt that way ever since. What was your prime motivation? I mean, I, I'm sure some people just go into the medical profession because they, they see dollar signs and they think, you know, I, I know doctors make money, so I'm going to be a doctor. And other people probably go through just a pure sense of altruism and wanting to help people. For many, maybe it's somewhere in between. So where do you lie in there? You know, I don't, I don't know if it was either of those. At that age, I don't think, you know, you have a whole lot of appreciation <laughs> for what it, earning income and, and that kind of thing, because things are all taken care of for you by your parents. But uh, I think it was just, there was, I first of all, I was fascinated by, by the, the subject and the field. And I felt that, wow, if you could heal somebody, if you could fix somebody, that's just really a special skill. And I, I think that I just had a great admiration for, for the job. And I, I just wanted to be a part of it. So you basically just thought it was pretty, pretty darn cool that you could uh, actually fix people that are sick or have an injury or what have you. And then, yeah. And then later on, when I got older, I said, wow, this Provides good income too. That's even better, you know that kind of thing. So, but that wasn't the original motivation, and it wasn't altruistic because, I mean, I'm not altruistic, but it, of course, it's a great feeling to to be. You know, you're important to people that you're making a difference. That was definitely part of it. And how did your political views develop? I guess alongside your your professional, you know, I guess your your professional work because you know I, I know as soon as you got into your practice, I'm sure you started realizing a lot of the ways that government regulations and and that sort of thing affect the way you do business. Did you have sort of a free market libertarian views before that, or did this sort of develop as your career progressed? No, actually, it predates my career. Um, it's it's really interesting because it's counterintuitive. I. Like I said, I grew up in a blue-collar neighborhood in, in Brooklyn. Everybody was sort of Democrats and liberal and pro-labor union and all that, as was my family. And I went to uh, college in the, from 1969 to 1973. I went to Brooklyn College at the height of uh, you know the campus demonstrations. that started off as anti-war demonstrations, but they sort of got morphed into – Get out of Vietnam, free Angela Davis, free health care, kind of all became a package. So, you know, I you would think that it would be easy for me to just kind of fit right into that whole thing. But I, I, I guess when I started college, I, I started thinking for myself, my parents weren't terribly political, but they didn't they did encourage, uh, you know, being in, getting involved with things that matter to you. And um, I I think part of it, to be to be quite honest with you, I. 
I, and this is probably not unusual when you're about 18 years old. I was kind of in a mood where I wanted to be sort of an iconoclast. So when everybody was kind of the in thing to do was to be sort of a leftist, I kind of intentionally started picking up copies of National Review, started reading the Republican newspapers in New York City at the time, like the, uh, the Herald Tribune, which doesn't exist anymore. I reflected back on that a lot of times saying, what, you know, how did I do this? And I think part of it was just like I didn't want to conform. And then when I started doing that, it, it kind of opened my mind to thinking about things. And actually in 1970, I was, a, I think I was my, in my second year actually in college and 18 year olds had just gotten the right to vote. So I registered to vote and I decided to probably be the, I, I was definitely the first person in my family to register Republican on either side. And probably one of the only people in college to do that. And that was part of my rebelliousness, believe it or not. And so there was a Senate race. Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, as you know. And, and Governor Rockefeller appointed a, a liberal Republican to fill out his term, Charles Goodell, whose son is the NFL commissioner now. And uh, 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 even more left-wing progressive Democratic uh, congressman challenged him in the, in the, in the election 1970 for – you know, after Kennedy's term was uh, served out. So in New York state, state, they have four parties, the Republicans, Democrats, the Liberals, Conservatives. And the Conservative Party tended to be, a, they just kind of would endorse the Republican nominee and the Liberal Party would endorse the Democrat nominee. Well, uh, they couldn't in this case. So James Buckley, hmm. William Buckley's brother, who was a businessman, and of course the famous Buckley versus Vallejo decision, he, uh, he ran as a Conservative Party candidate I turned on the, the, the first debate uh, expecting now, you know, I was into, into the tribalism thing. So I was going to root for, they didn't have red blue <laughs> teams then, but I was going to root for the elephant team, I guess. All excited to root for my guy. And when I heard this debate, um, there were questions like, uh, what are you going to do to improve low income housing in New York state? And one candidate said, well, I've, you know, sponsored all sorts of legislation to have more federal funding for housing. And then the other one said, oh, yeah, well, I sponsored more than you did. And in fact, you once voted against it. And then James Buckley spoke and said, I remember this in particular. He, and he said, you know, you, you notice you don't have a housing shortage in middle and upper income housing, only in lower income housing. And that's because that's the only housing where we still have these archaic rent controls. And he explained it. And in question after question, it was like that. And as you, you know, he actually won in a three-way race with about 39% of the vote. But after that debate, like I said, I was thinking a lot. For myself independently and I said wow that this I hate it I hate to admit this but my guy sounds just like the other guy but this guy sounds like he's making some sense so I went down to his headquarters which was run by uh, Cliff White who had run Barry Goldwater's presidential campaign coincidentally and I asked for some literature because this is you know this was an era when students at college we, we were involved we weren't apathetic and I read it and the uh, next thing I know I'm volunteering well, there wasn't a libertarian party yet, but I was at the, at the headquarters. There were a whole bunch of, uh, you know, young American freedom types, uh, movement, either conservatives or libertarians. Uh, and they were all volunteers. A lot of them were a few years older than me they were, or out of college. And a lot of times when you're stuffing envelopes or doing, you know, errands and things to help the campaign, there was a lot of deep philosophical discussion. And I got exposed to these ideas and I started reading more and more. And I've always been... Um, a real stickler for consistency. Everything has to be consistent with me. So I started, I moved to being sort of, you know, William Buckley National Review type conservative during the campaign. But before the campaign was over, I already, I was having a lot of problems with, with, with those guys, some of those guys, because like I said, there were a lot of libertarians in that movement at the time. I was having a problem because, you know, they were all for getting the government, for example, out of regulating your business and out of your wallet, but they didn't seem to extend that into a lot of other areas of personal life, whether it's just your sexual activity or whatever. And to me, if, if it's all about freedom, and I was totally bought into that idea about being about freedom, I, well, then, you know, you, you got to be about freedom across the board. So I suddenly found myself, by the time the campaign was over, sort of moving in a more and more radical direction. And by the time... I was about halfway through college. I was already a, already a self-identified libertarian, and I was reading a lot of uh, you know literature, libertarian literature, subscribing to reason, um, 
Reason Magazine, reading Hayek. And the thing that really got me over is when somebody convinced me to read this big, thick book that was bigger than my organic chemistry book as a pre-med student. And that book was called Atlas Shrugged. And that kind of brought me all the way over. I'm one of the people of my generation, if you ask a lot of them, what brought you over to libertarianism? Uh, a lot of people in my generation said it was reading the works of Ayn Rand. So that was the sort of thing that brought me all the way over. So that by the time I was applying for medical school, because I was still pre-med, but I was a very uh, philosophical, politically aware, self-identified libertarian. And I've been that way ever since. When I was in medical school, uh, sort of a monastic existence. You're, in, you know, you're always, when you're not in class, you're in the hospital. There's not a lot of time to keep up and to be active. So I would keep up my subscriptions and try when I had some spare time to kind of read economics and political philosophy. But I didn't have a whole lot of time. Then I, I moved out to Arizona to do my residency. Nice. I started my practice there. I started off as a solo practitioner. Got successful, merged with two other solo guys who created the first group practice. And then when that started to get really busy, we gave each other a personal day a week. So I have a day off a week. Well, I guess I'm not normal because my normal partners would use that day for doing things like playing golf or whatever. I'd use that day for getting active. So by the time of the late 80s, I, I started getting actively. I was using my free time to get actively involved in causes. In the early 90s, I was when, when uh, Hillary Clinton was pushing her health care reform proposal, I got very involved with uh, uh, advocating for medical savings accounts. I, I wrote a lot about it. Uh, and uh, here at a state level, 1996, I believe, the state of Arizona passed a state-based medical savings account. And I was, I, I was uh, testifying in the legislature uh, in, in favor of that. I also got involved in, uh, you may or may not know, but in 1996, Arizona passed its first, they call it the Drug Medicalization Act. It was medical marijuana. It's actually medical everything. Medical everything? What does that mean? Does that mean your doctor could just about recommend anything if it was for medical use? Or? Yeah, the actual word of the, law of, the, of the proposition was that any drug that is currently illicit, if a doctor prescribes it for medical use and a person is found in possession of that drug and could, could produce that doctor's prescription, wow. then they are to be left alone at past. That sounds like the most, uh, dare I say, progressive, uh, you know, drug legislation that I've ever heard actually passed. So I'm, obviously, I, I know people aren't really getting prescriptions for meth out there right now. So what actually uh, is the reality of that bill? What actually happened with it? Well, it was a, it was a kind of a complicated bill. It was called the Drug Medicalization Prevention and Control Act of 1996. And it was a real interesting thing to work on because I was approached, the, the Cato Institute was, was a, I was already kind of very involved not as a, a scholar or anything, but uh, I was a major donor to Cato Institute. I got went to a lot of Cato Institute functions. And the uh, funder of this, who just passed away recently, this was a big issue of his, he contacted Cato Institute. The Cato Institute says, well, you know, we're not allowed to get involved in partisan campaigns or political campaigns because we're a tax-exempt organization. But we can put you in contact with a person that we know who lives in Phoenix, who's uh, – He'd probably be a good person to work with, and that's how I got. That's that's how I got introduced. It was a kind of a, a big package. It said parts of it are still in existence. So the first three on the first three convictions, you don't go to jail for nonviolent possession of any illegal drug in Arizona. And all people who were currently serving time for nonviolent possession of drug were eligible for parole. And then doctors could prescribe any illicit drug. And if a patient is found in possession of that drug with a prescription then they cannot be arrested. It passed, and then uh, it got challenged, and it uh, survived the challenge. But then the feds uh, went after the part of the, that last part of the law where it, you know doctors could prescribe any illicit drugs. It went to the Ninth Circuit Court, and it was really interesting. At the same time that we did this, California passed medical marijuana, same exact time. Now, we're a smaller state, so the big news was California passed medical marijuana, and, and you know, I was saying, wait a minute, what about us in Arizona? We did something even more comprehensive than that. But the way they worded their law, it said, if a doctor writes a note recommending marijuana, you can't be arrested. The way we wrote it, in retrospect, it was a mistake. We thought it was going to make it more politically acceptable. It says if a doctor writes a prescription. Now, I never saw a difference. I was actually on live television debating the Department of Health Services prior to the vote. Because I became the medical spokesperson for the campaign. I started off as just being a participant in the committee. Next thing you know, their polling showed that if a doctor is out there on TV speaking for them, that's going to really have a lot of credibility 
and they asked me if I would do it. I asked my partners because I figured it could impact on the practice. And my partner said, what you do on your own time is your business. I was really happy. That was really nice of them. And then next thing you know, I'm doing TV commercials and I was debating. So you basically became the face of this bill almost. Uh. And, and my kids were in high school at the time. <laughs> and they would come home and say, Dad wants everyone to do drugs. <laughs> say your dad on TV, him, you know, calling for legalizing drugs. And they go, yeah. And they go, cool. But, <laughs> but my Your kids, dad's awesome. <laughs> yeah, my kids were actually kind of, they didn't know how to feel about it. On the one hand, you know, they kind of almost kind of, it was awkward for them. Um, but in any case, uh, what happened was, uh, in that debate, I, they said, this this is going to be thrown out. The feds will stop it. And I said, well, they can't. If you look up the, on the dictionary a prescription, it's a doctor's recommendation for treatment. I'm just giving somebody my recommendation. I have the right to, you know, free speech and the free exchange of scientific information. I'm not forcing them to take it. I'm telling them I recommend this. Um, it went to court. And in California, the Ninth Circuit actually found that Californians can stand because the doctor wrote a letter recommending it. But Arizona's can't because the doctor wrote it on a prescription pad. And I, I still don't understand it to this day, but the wording of the opinion was that writing a prescription is more proactive than rendering just an opinion on a note of paper. Which is essentially what a prescription is as well, right? I mean, it's, it's maybe has a little more legal backing to it when it's called a prescription. Whereas out here in California, if, if people go to a doctor and, and they want medical marijuana for something, it's it's technically not called a prescription. It is called a recommendation. They then can bring that legal recommendation to a, a marijuana facility. And that was considered these free exchange of scientific information. Right. So we went back to the drawing board. So the rest of the law still stands. All the people who were in prison were eligible for parole. And in this state, first three convictions, you don't go to jail. You're referred to rehab. From a philosophically pure standpoint, some of my libertarian friends were saying, come on, Jeff, you're selling out. First of all, you shouldn't need a prescription to get marijuana. You should just get it. It's a free country. And you shouldn't be sent to rehab. There's nothing wrong with you if you smoke a joint on a Friday night after work. You don't need rehab. And many of the people behind this campaign, we all agreed with that, but we also were trying to move the ball down the field. And we felt that, you know, if we could just get this far, this is the kind of thing that could pass, which it did. And, you know, we were trying to shake things up and, 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 and open up people's minds to, to hopefully, hopefully eventually ending prohibition. Right. Well, you do get that a lot in the libertarian movement where uh, if, unless you are advocating full, full whatever. I mean, I look, I personally advocate a full legalization of drugs. I think it's a crime to attack someone for simply owning a plant or owning whatever substance. But at the same time, when when a law comes up that say legalizes marijuana and it maybe not, doesn't do so perfectly, but hey, it's going to keep a lot of people out of jail. And uh, it's not pure legalization as we might want it. It's still better than than keeping it purely illegal and putting way more people in jail. So we still have to be able to recognize that sometimes a compromise isn't selling out. It's just making progress in the right direction. This is that age old discussion, you know, on our side, these, these arguments that take place. Are you pure enough? My sentiments are pure. <laughs> Some of us are, uh, are more willing to accept what well, we're just trying to, we're trying to move, get something accomplished and move the ball down the field, I guess would be the, the football analogy. What was also gratifying, by the way, in 2010, we passed medical marijuana in Arizona just as a pure, clean, basically a clone of California's bill. So we kind of fixed that. Uh, but um, what I found gratifying about that experience, for the first time I was working on a, probably similar to California. These are nonpartisan committees that are formed, and we get signatures, we file a petition, all that kind of stuff. So I was working with people who ordinarily, could, from my activism, I thought of as being adversaries because – this was one issue that there were progressives and other leftists who agreed with us libertarians on the drug prohibition issue. And there were even some conservatives. So this was a committee consisting of people from across the spectrum. What I found very valuable, just as a, as a life experience, was that you know when you get past those walls that we tend to build, barriers, there's, there's kind of a tribalism, you know, uh, and you tend to... Now, they're the other team. Well, we're all now working together in a project, and you start to realize that a lot of these people are not – they're not bad people. They may not understand a lot about economics. <laughs> they, they may be misguided about things, but you know they're also trying to make things better. And you also start to develop mutual respect and friendships. And then when a couple of years later you find yourselves 
as activists on opposite sides of another issue. It's there's no uh, there's no enmity there. It's like you just you kind of both respect each other, but you're on opposite sides of this issue. It actually makes it was a very valuable experience for me. It kind of takes a lot of the uh, the partisan flavor out of things. Right. It's it's all about. It's all about liberty. It's not about, you know, what label you have. Well, Jeff, that's certainly true. And that's the same attitude I try to carry over into this show because labels get us so bogged down and can often prevent us from getting to the root of the problems. We're going to try to get to those roots with you in a bit. But first, I'd like to take a minute to tell everyone a bit more about our sponsors at Health Excellence Select because many of you out there are likely facing some major sticker shock when it comes to your health insurance. As someone who purchases my own health insurance, I was completely frustrated by my escalating premiums and deductibles after the implementation of Obamacare, and this forced me to seek an alternative. And I found that alternative in the concept of health sharing, where groups of like-minded individuals get together to voluntarily cover each other's medical costs. Health Excellence Select will help you take charge of your health care without having to deal with all the costs and hassle of handling paperwork and spending hours on the phone with bureaucrats just trying to get paid. They will handle all the dirty work for you while also providing tons of valuable tools to help you stay healthy. Guys, I do not sell snake oil. I am a health sharing participant myself, and I cannot recommend these guys at Health Excellence Select highly enough. For more information, head over to lionsofliberty.com slash health. So, Jeff, yeah, you've been so you know actively involved in, I guess, fighting for health care freedom uh, politically for basically what sounds like most of your actually professional career. So there's been a, a strong parallel there. So can obviously, you know, everybody's obsessed with Obamacare right now because it's it's affecting many people directly. I mean, personally, my insurance rates doubled. Uh, my deductibles doubled. I'm a healthy guy. I don't really go to the doctor. And then suddenly I'm, and I buy my insurance because I'm a freelancer. So suddenly I, I was facing a scenario where I had a relatively low premium before. Well, now that things more than doubled and uh, it, I'd have to spend six or eight thousand dollars before I even got one dime of coverage and and knowing my health I, I'm just never gonna I'm not gonna get to that point and if I did it would be something terribly catastrophic which is the only reason I had insurance in the first place but now I'm not really even allowed to have catastrophic insurance so the, the you know the cascade here that affects so many people that weren't affected negatively too much I guess by by the health care laws before or by health insurance before at least they didn't feel it so much in the pocketbook now a lot of people are feeling it. But the fact of the matter is, Obamacare didn't start the problems with, with medicine, and, and you know that more than anybody because you've been in this industry for, for so long. So what are some of the ways that other government re- regulations, going as far back as you want to go, maybe even before you entered the medical profession, what are the ways in which the government has basically, and I guess, hindered the progress of the medical profession and, and made medical care more difficult for people to receive? You're right. This is only the latest installment. Um, actually, you know, I give a course at Arizona State University Extension, I'm giving again this January, on the hi- history of America's healthcare system and how we got to where we are. And uh, I also, my colleague and I did, a, uh, we have a, an online on demand 90 minute video series that's kind of a short version of that course on learnliberty.org. So if people want to hear it. But, but you know, my profession is, is not blameless. Back in the early 1800s, the AMA was created with the mission of getting licensure of doctors in the states because at that in, at that time doctors in this country uh, a lot of them had to have a second job they were itinerant there were a lot of different competing uh, schools of thought because it was kind of the early days of the science of medicine so there, there was no right answer there were various you know there were the, uh, the homeopaths the allopaths the, the all sorts of different the eclectics there were all different schools of thought and they sort of wanted to, to gain hegemony and they were lobbying state legislatures to get medical licensing, and they weren't getting anywhere until after the Civil War year and the Progressive year started to dawn, and then they succeeded. And on the state level, um, they got states to pass laws saying you can't practice medicine without a license, and the licensing board consisted of the state chapter of the American Medical Association. So it was great. It was a catch-22. you got to belong to the club to get a job, and you can't get a job unless you belong to the club, and you, know, and you, can't, you can't belong to the club unless you have the job. So it kind of closed the field. And, and this was basically protectionism. I mean, if you can keep certain people out of your profession and keep it in a sort of a, a an old boys club, well, guess what? You can charge a lot more than you would have otherwise. Right. So, so uh, you know, that's what I'm saying. So we, my ancestors, not me, I had nothing to do with it, but my ancestors created this cartel. And they actually also, uh, and it's a long, I don't want to, you know, so of course, take the course or watch the video. But And we'll link to all your course and everything in the, the show notes of the show as well. Okay, great. They, they, they took the control of the medical education system by basically uh, they funded the Carnegie Foundation's what was called the Flexner Report. Abraham Flexner was an educator. This is 1913. 
they came up with what was basically common core for medical education. And that's when they started making medical education in order to be an AMA approved medical school. You had to be, uh, you had to have a, a four year undergraduate degree because up until then you didn't have to. It required a lot more uh, science and research and it made it a four year school and it made it very expensive. And if you didn't, if you didn't meet these criteria, then you weren't AMA accredited. And the state licensing boards to this day will not give you a license unless you graduated an AMA accredited medical school. So they now, as a result of that, even if you pass all the same boards and tests and, and went through, you know, prove that you have the same amount of knowledge. Doesn't matter. So if you want a license for a medical license, it has to be an AMA accredited medical school. And that was a way of keeping down the control of the production of doctors. After that, after the Flex report, the number of medical schools in this country dropped about in half. And ironically, it used to be prior to the, to the 1920 or so, 50% of medical school graduates were women. And there were a large number of minorities. But, but up until the 70s and 80s, we saw it would almost be all white, upper middle income people because those are the only people who were able to afford to go to medical school. And in addition, in addition, there were many black medical schools that had actually had a higher, a better student teacher ratio, but they didn't meet the Flexner Report criteria, so they were not accredited. So they just all, all but a couple disappeared. Ah, so there's so, even a, a racial aspect to, to this as yeah, well. Yeah, and and then and then it came the the, the 1930s and uh, the depression. Then the Blue Cross came to be, which was a way of getting people to prepay into a hospital insurance so that it, it in return for prepaying, if you ever need to be in a hospital, then the first number of days is free. And that was a way of getting some cash flow because people weren't going to the hospital. It was hard economic times. The hospitals were having trouble keeping the doors open. Well, if I can get everybody, you know, there's an economic argument for this, just like when you buy you know, home warranty insurance. You may never need to, to get your refrigerator fixed, but if I could pay you $20 a month so that in case I need my refrigerator fixed, You'll come out and fix it for a small deductible. You're getting a lot of cash that you hope you'll never have to part with. So, and that from that, health insurance evolved. And then uh, the progressives got into wanting to give a bunch of free stuff out. They started giving money to expand hospitals and medical schools in the forms of grants. And then Medicare came on the scene. And now everybody over 65 got virtually free health care. And, and then Medicaid after that. And I came on the scene as a practicing doctor in 1981, but as a medical student in the, in the mid to late 70s, mid 70s, when I was growing up, the Buick was the doctor's car. The doctor was always comfortable. He always put food on his table for his family, but he was not wealthy. He was kind of upper middle income. But by the time I graduated medical school, the doctors were driving Mercedes and BMWs and, and, and there was a reason for it. And that's at the same time that by all metrics, healthcare was getting worse. <laughs> Right, right. And the third party payment system, a lot of, some of it has to do with tax laws too. In 1954, Basically, the IRS said an employer-provided health insurance is a non-taxable benefit. But if you buy your own health insurance, you got to buy that with, with an after-tax dollar. So that encouraged people to try to get employer-provided health insurance with as low a deductible as possible because you got to pay for deductibles out of pocket with after-tax dollars. So health insurance morphed from being an actual insurance like you would get, you know, for homeowners or accident insurance or whatever. It morphed into basically a tax deferred prepaid health account. And, th and that's led to the situation we are in now where most people can't imagine other than freelancers like themselves can't imagine a world where, where their health insurance is not directly connected to their employment. Right. But now we have this huge third party that's wedged between the consumer and the producer or provider in the marketplace. So we have that destroyed the market because when I as a doctor or a hospital is negotiating price, we're not negotiating with the end user, the patient, we're negotiating with the, with the insurance company. And the insurance company doesn't have the same exact context as the end user. In fact, I wrote about this. I have an article called Healthcare's Third-Party Payment Trap. It's on Reason.com. You know, we all remember about Milton Friedman's four ways of spending money, your own money on something for yourself, your own money on something for someone else, someone else's money on something for you, and someone else's money on something for yet another person. And he talked about that we ask our politicians to spend somebody else's money on something for somebody else. That's what they do for that's their job, so don't be surprised when they purchase an eight hundred dollar, you know, toilet seat and things like that, because it's not their money, it's not for them. That's the way the insurance companies working too. They're pooling everybody's money and they're using it to pay for health care for, for other people, not for them. So when they're negotiating with providers, they're not trying to get the best price for the patient. They're trying to get the best price 
that would allow them to offer their product at a premium to compete with their competitors. Essentially, the people making the most important medical decisions are not the people that should be because the people that should be are the patient and the doctor. And now we've put so many third parties, whether it's the hospitals, the billing co- companies, the insurance companies, the government, all these third parties are in the middle of it. And all that's done is, is make worse care at a higher cost. And rather than reintroduce the marketplace to this, the solution of government for the last 40, 50 years has been to try to control the this- the supply side. Let's pass another law. Let's tweak it here. Let's tax this. Let's have doctors had a practice. Let's have committees that look up, you know, let's let's study the data and based upon the data, we'll tell doctors this is that's how it's gotten to now. In my article about how governments destroyed the healthcare system, it's gotten to a point now where basically committees that are in you know, government and panel committees by the CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services that oversees Medicare and Medicaid, these committees come up with they read journal articles and they look at data and they say, this is how you will practice medicine. Now, that's their opinion. And sometimes I may agree with them. In other words, there's this now one best way. And they've decided if we could do things this one best way, then we will not waste as much money. And the way they enforce that is they tell the hospitals, which rely very heavily on Medicare and Medicaid, something like 60% of their income is either through Medicare or Medicaid. And they tell them that unless you can get your doctors to comply with these protocols and algorithms that we've drawn up, we need at least 80% compliance from your doctors that practice in your hospital. Unless you can get them to do that, then we're going to pull back money that we already gave you for services rendered. So then the hospitals plead with us private practicing doctors to, to, to follow these guidelines because if they have to give money back, then they're going to have financial problems, they're going to have to cut back on staffing and equipment, and it's going to impact everybody. And of course, we were aware of that, so we try as best possible to to cooperate. But of course, as more and more doctors are finding it impossible to comply with all of the regulations and stay in practice because the compliance costs are becoming so costly, particularly this one-size-fits-all, one-best-way electronic health record system that we all have to fit into. It's made a lot of guys go out of business, so they're all becoming, they're selling their practices, becoming employees of hospitals. Because this way, the hospital could deal with all of the compliance costs and, and, and also any of the penalties for not keeping up with the latest regulation that comes out every couple of weeks. Because no long, it's no longer my headache. The hospital administration will deal with that. I'm just an employee. So this is, this is making private practices, I guess, a lot more rare. Is that, is that right? Yeah, that about maybe 20% of doctors in the country. Uh, because I, you know, I've heard people defend Obamacare, and even to the point that they'll say, well, yeah, we're going to lose a lot of doctors, but you know, that's just one of the costs, the quote-unquote costs, which seems so crazy to me that a law that's supposed to improve people's access to health care, a part, an accepted part of that would be less doctors. That seems absurd. Not only that, but the whole attitude changes. And I'm talking about, well, guys like me just say, you know what, I'm... I, I'm done. I'm leaving. But younger guys who can't afford to do that, you know, they have families and things, young families. Uh, what happens is you find that you have to almost, you, you be transformed into a, a government clerk because you, you can't, like, for example, I'll give you a personal, perfect example. Personally, the other day I ordered a prophylactic antibiotic for my patient that I'm about to operate on at the hospital. You know, that's an antibiotic given to prevent infection. And then the nurse called me to say, the patient tells her that he's actually allergic to that antibiotic. So what do you want to order as a substitute? So I had a whole list of things in my head that I said, well, we can give this or we can give that. I had a a whole list in my head to choose from. Unfortunately, part of me was saying, well, what what am I allowed to prescribe? What is the, I forgot what the algorithm is that I must comply with that says which antibiotic I can prescribe if they're allergic to this particular one that I recommended. So I asked the nurse, could you tell me which one I'm allowed to prescribe when the patient's allergic to this? And she said, hold on. And she went and looked. You could prescribe, you know, X, Y, or Z. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, let me prescribe X then. And it's reaching a point where I don't, I don't even, even me, I don't feel like I could use my judgment because it's all about compliance. So I'm not an independent thinker anymore. I'm not allowed to be. I get penalized if I'm an independent thinker. If I think independently too much, then I get, I'm, a, I'm what they call an outlier. And first I get a couple of, talk, I get talked to, but then eventually I get penalized. And I could even be. And who, who, who would penalize you then? Is it would it be the AMA or how's that, how does that work? We're moving towards a new payment system. It's called uh, pay for performance. Okay. It's a new, Medicare is moving to this. They hope to get to that by around 2017. 
where instead of you getting paid for what you do, you're going to get paid for outcomes based upon their benchmarks for outcomes. So it's already happening. It's being implemented in. So, for example, with certain diseases like congestive heart failure, COPD, if you're readmitted to the hospital within 30 days of being discharged from the hospital for treatment for that problem, then Medicare will no longer pay for that second admission, which has a lot of doctors stressing out because during the wintertime in cold, wet climates, people with emphysema, they'll oftentimes go into attacks where they have to be hospitalized and then they get released. And then two weeks later, they slide back and have to come in again. So there's a tendency now to try to keep them out of the hospital and try to treat them in the emergency room and, and, and keep sending them home from the emergency room, even if they're coming in every couple of days, because if you readmit them, that'll count as a readmission within 30 days. And the hospital will have to basically do all of this treatment for gratis. And in a couple of years, the doctor as well will be treated, starting with the hospital and then the doctors. This pay for performance. So if you're a doctor and you have a higher usage of antibiotic rate than their bell curve average, or if you have a higher readmission rate or higher length of stay in the hospital rate for your patients for certain diagnoses, then you're going to get penalized because if your bill to Medicare is, let's say, for argument's sake, $1,000, they'll say, well, because you had a higher uh, length of stay in the hospital rate last year, you're going to get a 20% reduction in reimbursement for your for everything you send us a bill for. That's your punishment. <laughs> so what that's going to do, I can tell you what it's going to do, depending on if you're a very good doctor, and therefore everybody with really complicated problems wants you to take care of them or they refer to you. Well, just because of the population that's being selected for you, you're going to have a higher likelihood of having people in the hospital a long time because all the sick, complicated cases are getting referred to you. And that's going to skew your numbers. Whereas the guy who doesn't have a lot of sick, unhealthy, complicated patients, he's got great numbers. So he's going to get paid better than you. So doctors are going to start, you know, there's, there's ways of doing things without it becoming obvious. There's subtle ways, but they're going to be cherry picking the number of sick, complex patients they see because all eyes are going to be on their numbers. What are my you know, length of stay numbers, what are my readmission rate numbers, what are my antibiotic use numbers. I got to make sure I don't have too many patients that drive those numbers in the wrong direction or it's going to hurt me. Uh, Jeff, you know, it sounds like, you know, we always talk about the patients when it comes to healthcare and, and, and sick people. And obviously that makes sense because those are the people that need healthcare. But it sounds like, uh, you know, one of the other major victims in all this is the doctors. The doctors are the ones getting squeezed by all these new laws. I'm sure there are some that, that think it's wonderful depending on, you know, where they are in the system. But it sounds like for the average guy, the average guy that wants to run his own, you know, private practice and work with, directly with his patients, that guy's getting pushed out of the industry. And that, that's just a terrible thing. And uh, Jeff, I know we're running short in time. So I I really do appreciate you going through all this with us because it's really the, the root of the problem that we have to get to. It, the, the stuff with the, the medical licensing, the AMA, this is the stuff where, where it all starts. And in order to uh, to fix things, we have to really know where things started going astray. We can't just look at the last four or five years and act like everything was, was peachy before that. Right. So, so we, built, we built our little nice little cushy cartel, but then we kind of made this bed that now we have to sleep in. So a lot of this, you know, the, is kind of the chickens coming home to roost. Although... To be fair, you know, I wasn't there when this happened to 150 years ago. But um, and what, what I do see there, it might be actually to end on an optimistic note, more and more doctors. Well, first of all, a lot of the young doctors are being trained in this is the way medicine is practiced. So they don't even know another world. They just know they, they're being trained to, in medical school now to follow templates and algorithms and protocols and make sure their numbers are right. So they're being it's a different kind of person being trained to be a doctor today. But more and more doctors who are thinking or who are older and saw it a different way and see where things are going, they're quitting. And they're starting private, cash only, no insurance, no Medicare, nothing practices. You're probably aware there's a Dr. Keith Smith. I am very aware because he's been a guest on the show before. Okay. So we're seeing these kind of things proliferate. And when I we have concierge services as well. I've talked to Josh Umber of, of Atlas MD. There are all sorts of ways that uh, you know, people are, are, are finding ways to get around the system. And that's what, what I'm hoping will happen is eventually, um, sort of like, you know, with modern technology, we're, we're, we're finding a way to kind of abandon the taxi cartel through Uber and other things like that, Airbnb. Well, maybe what's going to happen is through modern technology uh, and 
fortunately, nobody, no doctors are forced to participate in plans in order to have their license, at least not yet. But, but what, what's, so we're go, I think we're going to start to see more and more doctors who are independent thinkers say, I'm not playing this game anymore. I'm getting out of this system and, and going to practice my own way. And more and more patients are going to say, you know what? I don't want to, I don't want to be in the system. I want to, I want to be able to choose my healthcare provider, be the doctor or some other kind of healthcare provider. I want to make the decision. It's my life. I want to spend my money the way I want to. And I want somebody who's going to be answering questions and be accountable to me and nobody else. And they'll find each other. And, you know, I, I'm hoping that we'll kind of have two, you know, alternate universes. <laughs> All right. Well, Jeffrey, I'm so glad you were able to uh, enter this alternate universe, the Lions of Liberty alternate universe, where uh, we try we try to have rational conversations about politics, which is something we don't really uh, see too much of out there, unfortunately. So I'm glad you can come in here, and, and I appreciate all your time you spent here, uh, because you really did a really good job, I think, getting into the history of this, uh, which a lot of people aren't aware of. A lot of people, um, you know, the history of medical care goes back five years or, or maybe ten years, but uh, you really got into the weeds with us, and we really do appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Singer, before I let you go, is there anything else you'd like to plug, promote, or just let people know how they can get in touch with you or find your work? Yeah, well, I, I'm an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. So if they go to cato.org and they look under experts and then look for click for adjunct scholars, you'll see I have my own page there and it has links to a lot of my publications and media appearances. Um, you could also uh, go to learnliberty.org and look for the course called America's Healthcare System, How We Got Into This Mess and How to Get Out. It's a free online on-demand course and basically takes this course that I give that's a, a 10-hour course and kind of shrinks it down to 90 minutes of a series of videos that total up to 90 minutes. And um, so, you know, it doesn't prevent you from going deeper, but at least it kind of gives you an overview. And then if anybody lives in the Phoenix area and would like to take my course, it's available. Um, it starts January 6th and goes every Wednesday from 7 to 9 p.m. at the ASU Extension at Skysong. Um, and it goes for five weeks and you could, uh, contact me through my email address and I'll be happy to, uh, give you the link to, to learn about the course and to sign up for it. My email address, I'm happy to mention it. It is dr number four Liberty. That's doctor for Liberty. Easy to remember at gmail.com. There you go. Dr. Jeffrey Singer. Thank you so much once again and keep up the great work. Thank you. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed my conversation today with Dr. Jeffrey Singer, and we will link to his article, How the Government Killed the Medical Profession, over in the show notes at lionsofliberty.com slash 170, but it really only scratched the surface on the problems with healthcare, and that's why I wanted to have him on to get a bit deeper into things, because the problems with our medical system did not just start in the last five to ten years. They really go back to the cartelization of the medical industry, and really, it was the doctors themselves who started this through the AMA, the Flexner Report, and the Institution of Medical Licensing, because those are the issues that need to be addressed. You know, focusing specifically on Obamacare makes you look like an apologist for the right wing. It makes you sound like a crony capitalist. So by all means, speak out against Obamacare, but do so in context and recognize that in many ways, the call for Obamacare, the calls for universal health care, these are really just knee-jerk responses to decades and decades and decades of protectionism in the medical industry. And that's going to do it for this week, guys. I'd like to invite you to continue this conversation with us over in our private Facebook group, the Lions of Liberty Forum. You can type that in your Facebook search bar. We'll also link to it over at the show notes at lionsofliberty.com slash 170. You can also find our, our main Facebook page at facebook.com slash lionsofliberty. And why don't you tweet to us while you're at it? Find us on Twitter at Lions of Liberty. This coming Thursday, I will welcome back our resident Rand Paul analyst, Mr. Brian McWilliams for the final edition of Rand Pauluses and Minuses for 2015, where we'll take a look back at the good and the bad of the past year of the Rand Paul presidential campaign. Until then, folks, live long and live free. Head of editing and mastering is John Dauber. Contact Johnny53 at gmail.com.